is good and all the time. The Lord is good and all the time. The Lord is good and all the time. The Lord is good and that is nature. If the Lord has done for you something, give you a big, big hand clap to the Lord. Hallelujah. So we are going to lift the name of the Lord because He has given us victory. Hallelujah. Yay. He has given me victory. Lift Him high. Praise the Lord. The Lord has done so many things. Not so. Some of us are lifting him like this. You can't lift God like this. You have to lift him. Hi, praise the Lord. So we are going to repeat that one more time. Let's go a bit higher. One more time. With a lot of lot of thanksgiving. Because the Lord has been good. Praise the Lord. He has given me victory. Let's lift our hearts to the Lord. Yes. He has given me victory. I lift him higher. Higher. He has given me victory. I lift him higher. Higher. My Lord has given me joy. Lift him higher. Higher.
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful this afternoon as we worship and praise you for the sacrifice that your son Jesus Christ offered to die, to die and redeem the world of sin and yet he was sinless. What a great love that you love the world and you gave your only one son to die for us. Lord, what can we give back to you apart from giving you our worship and praises and offering ourselves to do your service and to love others as we, you have loved us. Lord, because we live in this sinful world, it is not an easy thing to do. But we know since you have given us the Holy Spirit to guide us in our works, that Lord, you will always call us back to you through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit will always convict us to always do what is right. Lord, as we come this afternoon, to draw from you the words of wisdom that is written in your word. Father, we pray that you accept us, cleanse us. If there's any uncleanness in us that blocks us from hearing you and blocks your word from coming forth to us, Lord, I pray that you cleanse us this afternoon. Father, I pray for our colleagues and our friends who are not here, that Lord, you will minister to them. Wherever they are, your spirit will convict them, Lord to always know you as Lord and Savior and to fellowship as your word tells us in Hebrew chapter 10 verse 25 that we should not neglect coming together to fellowship because we stir up one another in love. We thank you Lord because we know you are here and all this we have prayed believing you have heard through your son Jesus Christ our Lord. May we continue in the words of the Lord's prayer together. Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us today our daily food forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forevermore amen still in the mood of prayers let us sit and we receive intercession led to us by Madame Dorothy. Just pray. Dear God, we are so thankful today for being here in this holy place. We express our gratitude for the abundance in our lives, in all aspects of life. We appreciate you, God, for the beauty of nature and the opportunities that you bring to us each new day. May we never take these blessings for granted. And may you always strive to share our abundance with those in need. Pardon us, O oh Lord, in our thoughts, in our words, and indeed, as we bring our requests before you, define Creator, we lift our hearts again in prayer before you. As we surrender the province of the Church of Uganda unto your hands, we pray, King of Glory, that you continue being with them, God. May your grace abound with every church, especially here in Stone Cross Chapel, Jacque. Filling each heart with love, compassion, and understanding. Bless the hands that serve, the voices that proclaim your word, and the hearts that open wide to welcome the weary and the, the lost. Let your will be done, O oh Lord. Most gracious and loving God, we put before you the, all the institutions of learning, most especially our own, University UCU. We surrender to you, our dear Deputy Vice Chancellor, deans of all faculties, our lecturers, the students' body, and the support staff. Bless and preserve their lives. 
as they serve you in this great place. Protect this sacred place from harm, both physical and spiritual, in your infinite mercy, O oh Father. Compassionate God, at this singular time, we pray for our country, Uganda. Keep our president, ministers, members of parliament, and all the local leaders at different levels. May you guide, give them wisdom and, and understanding so that peace and truth reigns in our country. In a special way, King of glory, we surrender our families unto your hands. As we know, families are ordained by you, King of glory. And all that gives in our families and marriages come from you, specifically the children. Please, Lord, take care of all the couples and their children represented here today. We sincerely present the struggling couples before you, Lord, who have not yet gotten a blessing of children. Dear God, hear their prayer and answer them according to your own will. King of glory, we surrender the sick unto your hands and those the grieved families who lost their dear ones. We put them before you that those in hospitals, God, clinics, and even those whose conditions have worsened and are bedridden and being nursed in homes, reach them today, O oh God, not forgetting those who have made it here and they are not well. Heal them, Father, and let them not go back the way they came. Surely, Lord, we commit this community service unto your hands. As we pray for the chaplaincy for the great work so far done and yet to be done, use our preacher, the leader, and bless all the listeners that everything shall be done according to your own will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord. Please check on that neighbor and give a smile to them. You never know that is what they need this afternoon. Yes, a smile can heal a soul. Hallelujah. Smile to me also. I need that smile. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. And all the time. Wow, wow, wow. We give him all the praise. I have a few announcements. This one is um, from the scholarship office. The scholarship office informs the general public that the Save a Body campaign is on. It's going until the 28th of March. We shall be giving collections during community worship and different parking yards, gates, every morning and every evening. And we are going to start the collection with this community worship. Baskets will be given, will be put at different sites uh, at the end of this service. This is to raise funds for our dear needy students. It's based on a simple ideology that if many people give a little, the little can become a lot. May the Lord bless us and provide for us as we give to, sa to save that body. Hallelujah. This Sunday, the 24th March, at 3 p.m., there will be a talk to Mama Pesh uh, on the topic depression here, at, uh, here in Kunkoyuyo Hall. The guest speaker will be Dr. Sabrina Kitaka. Please be informed. Men of Papa's Mentorship Program invites all men for a seminar this Saturday the 23rd, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. at Chaplain's Garden. The topic is life experience, pursuing purpose amid his life setbacks. And the speaker will be Mr. Charles Mitty. One fellowship is on, one, fe one family fellowship is on, and we shall be having it tomorrow 
in the evening, beginning from 5.30 p.m. here at Nkoyo Hall. Tomorrow morning, we will have the last Lenten service that will take place at 7.45 a.m. here at Nkoyo. Please join us as we wind up this season for the year. Save the Mothers will hold a, a maternal and child health conference and an AGM on the 26th April this year, starting from 10 a.m. here in the Nkoyo Hall. All the alumni are informed and invited. The conference fee is 50,000, payable to Ms. Caro Namono at STM office. And let me take this opportunity to invite Rachel to come and give us some information that she has. But let us take this opportunity to thank uh, the team that led us this afternoon. Let us thank them for leading us and so well. Thank you so much and good afternoon everyone. <laughs> my name is Rachel Robinson and I am the Uganda Studies Program Director. So these are my students. <laughs> along with the Honors College students. So thank you so much for having us. You may have seen these students around campus and wondered what are they doing here? <laughs> so I'm here today to just give you a little bit of information about the program, who we are and what we do and why. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the USP staff as well. So if you guys can wave. <laughs> so I also this afternoon want to highlight the fact that this is our 20th anniversary as a program of UCU. So that's exciting. We started back in 2004, and since then, in the 20 years, we've had over 970 students come from American and Canadian universities to study at UCU for a full semester. We have partnerships with over 100 universities. Um, this semester, we have 12 students studying with us from seven of those different universities. So while they're here, USP students take classes um, do internships in their specific um, areas of study. So that could be social work, global health, um, and our interdisciplinary emphasis, which covers all the rest. <laughs> uh, they are also here to learn about Uganda more broadly, about the cultures um, and what the world looks like and feels like from the Ugandan context and from Ugandan perspectives. So many of our students live here on campus in the UCU dorms with fellow Honors College and UCU students. Do we have any roommates in the house? Yay! <laughs> so many, so you all know the interesting experiment of learning to live together <laughs> and share space and figure out how to navigate schedules and the lights and when they should be on and when we should be sleeping and, and those sorts of things. Other students choose to live with a Ugandan host family for the full semester here in Mukono. We also do a, a week of rural homestays mid-semester. We go to a community either in Captura or in Serere so that our students learn what, it like, what it's like to live in the village for a week. During that week, you will find them digging in the gardens, hauling water on their heads, cooking over the fires, um, and learning what it means to live in the village. <laughs> so it is through these relationships with roommates and classmates, with host parents and siblings, lecturers and practicum supervisors, that students really learn what, it's, what it means to be um, in Uganda and what the world looks like from Uganda. And they are challenged to engage the world through, with, um, in thoughtful and creative ways. Students come away with a greater understanding of their own identities, deeper empathy for those around them, and a new lens through which to see God and the world. The openness and hospitality of Uganda, our Ugandan partners has created space for profound learning and transformation to occur in every context, from the classroom to homestays to internships. And in the process of engaging in each, with each other, us with you and you with us, <laughs> we are all changed and expanded. So we are grateful to UCU for the leadership, their vision and care of this great institution and for their support of the USP program. On a personal note, I have been with the USP program for 14 years now. <laughs> How many of us have been with UCU for over 14 years? <laughs> We're fewer and farther between. <laughs> But this will be my last semester, so you won't be seeing me again after this. 
But this work has been the joy of my life, and I am so, so grateful. I'm incredibly sad to be leaving this community, but I am trusting in God's leading in my own life and for the program and for all of you. We will be announcing my successor soon. So it is with deep love and gratitude for this community that we celebrate these past 20 years of friendship, connection, learning, and growth, and look to the next 20 years with excitement, curiosity, and trust in God's good work in our lives. So thank you for allowing me to share with you this afternoon. Just a little bit of USP. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel, for the, 20, for the 14 years that you have worked here at Uganda Christian University. This afternoon, our, the one who will bring to us the word of God is our Reverend Canon Paul Waswa Sembiro. Maybe there are those seeing him for the first time. He's our chaplain. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But before he comes, let us hear the reading of the word. Our reading is from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke, chapter 18, beginning from verse 18. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke, chapter 18, beginning with verse 18. And Elola asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he, shall, and he said, all these I have observed from my youth. And when Jesus heard it, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard this, he, be he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus, looking at him, said, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who had it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, What is impossible with men is possible with God. And Peter said, Lord, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly, I say to you, there is no man who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive manfold more in this time and in the egg to come eternal life. The word of the Lord. Let me invite you to bow with me for a word of prayer as we ask for God's help in engaging and understanding his word. Our blessed heavenly father, we honor you as we humble ourselves this afternoon. We come to your word knowing that it's like no other. It's inspired by your spirit 
and only your spirit can teach us your word. Come, Holy Spirit. Breathe upon the preaching of your word. Breathe upon this gathering. Lord, help us pay attention to your word, to your voice. Help me as I proclaim it, that I will speak as guided by you. To the end that together we'll be built up in Christ and continue to be the witnesses you have called us to be. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a joy for me to be here and share with you in God's word. Thank you for choosing to come and be with us. We appreciate all of you who sit in the overflow of sorts, that you make the time, you make the sacrifice to do your best to be part of the service. We will continue to remember the team in Mbale who went for exhibition organized by the National Council of Higher Education. And UCU is hosting as we had last week. But also, on a sad note, our sister, Esther Aguku, who works in the vice chancellor's office, lost a sister yesterday. And uh, preparations about barrio and vigils will be communicated. Let us remember Esther in prayer. A theme this afternoon is taken from our passage, and it's leaving everything for the sake of the kingdom of God. Leaving everything for the sake of the kingdom of God. To begin, we need to appreciate the idea of the kingdom of God. In some of our cultures, we have kingdoms, and it's easy to relate the idea of the kingdom of God to the kingdoms of Uganda, like Buganda, Toro, Bunyoro, and others. But the kingdom of God has a special meaning in the scriptures. First, it's a kingdom not limited to geographical boundaries. It is wherever Jesus reigns in the lives of God's people. Wherever Jesus reigns in the lives of God's people, that's where the kingdom of God is. But also the idea of kingdom in this particular uh, neighborhood of the passage we have read begins in chapter 17, verse 20, the coming of the kingdom. And Jesus says something very, very important about the kingdom that is in our midst. He says... The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that cannot be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. We pray, let your kingdom come, but it's also a kingdom that has come. A kingdom that continues to be spread and propagated by agents of the kingdom. Those are the people who believe in Jesus. So as we read in Luke 17, 20 to 21, he says the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is about God's people, is about habits, and is about unique values, values that align with God's will. It leads each of us to re-envision the whole of life. Richard Foster has put it succinctly, and this is what he says about the kingdom. He says, in Christ, we have been reborn into the new reality of the kingdom of God. We can become ambassadors of peace in the midst of a violent world, models of civility and grace in the midst of a competitive society, conveyors of faith and hope in the midst of a cynical culture and the embodiment of agape love to all peoples in the midst of adversarial society. The kingdom of God, about habits, about the way, a way of doing life different from the way the secular world does life. And so as we come to this text 
there are three key things we must walk away on this a theme, living everything in pursuit of the kingdom of God. First, we learn that the kingdom of God belongs to people who are like children. The kingdom of God belongs to people who are like children. So you step back a little bit, chapter 18, verses 15 to 17, to get this idea. The kingdom of God belongs to people who are like children. There we read verses 15 to 17. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Very powerful statements there. Talking about those who would qualify for the kingdom. Those who will enter the kingdom and likening them to children. The kingdom of God belongs to people who are like children. Belongs to people who are like children. Only those who receive the kingdom like children enter the kingdom of God. And so you need to stop and think about yourself as a UCU student, as a member of staff, and compare yourself to a child with regard to the kingdom of God. Because the words that come from Jesus are truth, not just mere opinion, but truth. The words that come from him are truth. You want to ask what qualities do children have which we must take seriously in relation to what it takes to receive the kingdom or to enter the kingdom. We can think of qualities like trust, like faith, but most importantly, responsiveness, obedience, and not being encumbered or entangled or overly attached, as we see later on in this passage. So those who receive the kingdom as children are the ones who enter the kingdom. Those who receive the kingdom with trust, with faith, with responsiveness to the bidding of Jesus, to what he requires them to do, with obedience. And those who are not encumbered, a theme he repeats again and again as he does in the parable of the sower. And so, friends, entering the kingdom does not come from having a good religious background or knowing the right Bible verses. It does not even come by having the right grasp on the Christian creeds. It's not for the sophisticated or the visionary. It's for those who are like children. You turn to this passage and it invites you to examine your attitudes, your posture, as you approach truth and matters of the kingdom of God. So the first point from our passage and theme is the kingdom belongs to people who are like children. The kingdom of God belongs to people who are like children. The second point is that eternal life is an inheritance of those who are in the kingdom. Eternal life is an inheritance of those who are in the kingdom. Please turn your attention to the passage read for us, Luke 18, beginning at verse 18. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. Other translations refer to this man as a rich young ruler. A rich young ruler. Possibly one belonging to the son Hedrin, the Jewish ruling class of about 70 people in the day. So he's one of those. He comes to Jesus knowing 
that something is missing in his life. Something is missing in his Christian, no, not Christian, Jewish Christian, in his faith or spirituality. Something is missing. He wants to have eternal life, but it would seem from the passage that eternal life is eluding him. Might it be that there are many people, even at this service, who, if they were to be honest with themselves, they know something is missing. Something is missing. So we have a representative in the scriptures. If you're in that place where you feel like something is missing, we have a representative right here. And sometimes the people we envy might be those people who know something is missing. So he came to Jesus seeking for answers about eternal life. He must be commended for knowing that eternal matters matter. Many of us live for the here and now. Even among the Balokole, our faith is only applied for praying for our daily bread, for things that are temporal. But he comes to Jesus asking about eternal life. Jesus presents him with the commandments. He presents him with the commandments. Please, as you read the scriptures, notice that Jesus does not recall the entire Decalogue, but just a few of the commandments. And when we look at the Decalogue, it has two parts. The part that invites us to love God and the part that invites us to love neighbor. And when Jesus chooses what to say to him, he chooses from the part that invites us to love our neighbors. Look at it and look at it very, very critically because what Dr. Luke is communicating here is very, very important. You know the commandments, verse 20, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Isn't Jesus aware that there is a commandment about not worshiping idols? observing the Sabbath, he's aware. But he chooses to draw his attention to this second part of the Decalogue. The young man assures Jesus that he has kept them all well since his youth. Amazingly, Jesus doesn't push back. Jesus doesn't argue. He allows the conversation to move on. All this seems to be okay until... Jesus offers him the advice he came looking for. Notice that Jesus offers the exact advice he came looking for, verse 22 to verse 25. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Many commentators I read about have argued that the idea of sell everything and give to the poor was given, the instruction was given only to this man in the scriptures, not to all of us. Conveniently, that's how they argue. That this instruction was only given to this man. Whatever it might be, there, there are important truths the master Jesus is communicating. He's saying that attachment to worldly wealth can become an idol, something that stands in the way of entering the kingdom of God. He's saying that neglect of the poor, not loving your neighbor as you love yourself and thereby meeting their needs shows that actually you are not keeping the commandments. When you appraise yourself very well and you think I'm scoring 98% on the commandments, just by not responding to the needs of the poor around you, like we have an opportunity 
at the end of this service to respond, you are actually not obeying the commandments of the Lord. But more pointedly, there are four things I want to highlight under this second main point. Number one, Jesus does not beg this man to stay. Jesus does not beg this man to stay. Matthew 19.22, this is how it renders the whole episode. He says in Matthew, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus, even as a loving savior who came to seek and save the lost, does not beg the man to stay. Friends, in the age of seeker, sensitive paradigms of the church, we need to learn from Jesus here. That in the ways of Jesus, he doesn't lower the standard because of winning someone. He upholds the standard. He doesn't lower the standard for any one of us so you can get into the kingdom. He doesn't lower the past mark. He doesn't, you know, go begging. Rich young ruler, it would be good for you to be part of my congregation. Not so with Jesus. Maxi Dunham has warned us church leaders, and he has said that some leaders seek to be all things to all persons until they forget who they are. Some leaders dilute the claims of the gospel and the demands of discipleship in order to attract more people. There is a danger of being so broad in what we publicly offer that we then find it impossible to cultivate the depth of commitment and spirituality that should characterize Christian community. Jesus does not beg this man to remain behind. Our hearts are moved when we see many of you departing from the faith. Many of you backsliding or compromising on your Christian values. But the standard of what it takes to enter the kingdom must never be lowered. Number two, here Jesus is communicating to us that if we are to enter the kingdom of God, it will have to happen on Jesus' terms, not on our terms. If we are to enter the kingdom of God, it will have to happen on Jesus' terms, not our terms. And that is very, very sobering. And sometimes... There are teachings that become very popular, and everybody is running to them. Everybody is joining these groups. But we are not to join or enter the kingdom on our terms, but on Jesus' terms. Number three, again, riches can make entering the kingdom of God difficult. Jesus uses a metaphor of impossibility when he refers to it's like a camel entering through the eye of a needle. Some commentators have explained away that actually the eye of a needle was a small gate, but actually that's not true. The eye of a needle is the eye of the needle because it's a metaphor in the day talking about impossibility or difficult. It is because riches offer a kind of security, a false security. And those who put their confidence in their riches don't seem to see the merits of letting go of what they have always trusted in to come into the kingdom. It's very difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Tell your neighbor, don't allow your riches to stop you from entering the kingdom. Now ask your neighbor, by the way, how many riches do you have? <laughs> don't allow... <laughs> your riches to stop you from entering the kingdom. Do you remember the man called Steve Jobs and the Apple company? These words are attributed to him on his deathbed. He said, I reached the pinnacle of success in the business world. In others' eyes, my life is the epitome of success. However, aside from work, I have little joy. 
In the end, my wealth is only a fact of life that I'm accustomed to. At this moment, lying on my bed and recalling my life, I realize that all the recognition and wealth that I took so much pride in have paled and become meaningless in the face of my death. You can employ someone to drive the car for you, make money for you, but you cannot have someone bear your sickness for you. Material things lost can be found or replaced, but there is one thing that can never be found when it is lost, that is life. Whichever stage in life you are in right now, with time you will face the day when the curtain falls. These are words of one of the riches that ever lived. And so Jesus is reminding us in this passage that riches can make it difficult for you and I to enter the kingdom of God. Like I said earlier, it's a theme that he talks about again and again. And in the parable of the sower, there is a category of seed that fell on good ground. It could have borne a lot of seed, but it was choked by the thorns. And some of what he says about the thorns are worries and riches. Riches can stop us from entering the kingdom of God. The fourth point under this second section is that salvation in the kingdom perspective has nothing to do with the affluence. Salvation in the kingdom perspective has nothing to do with the affluence. The people of Jesus' day thought that the rich, the rich had the opportunity to enter the kingdom because they had resources to contribute to the needs of the poor, thereby earning their salvation. But in this discourse between this man and Jesus, he makes it clear that salvation in the perspective of the kingdom has nothing to do with riches. And so as you reflect on this passage again, he's saying, give away the riches in order to gain treasures in heaven. Give away the riches. Give away what would be your GDP. What would be your monetary worth. Give it away in order to gain treasures in heaven. Salvation from the kingdom perspective has nothing to do with riches. Let me close by looking at the third section my third main point. And it's this, that there are rewards for leaving all things in pursuit of the kingdom. There are rewards for leaving all things in pursuit of the kingdom. Look at verses 28 to 30. After he says it's difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, it's impossible for them to be saved. Verse 28, and Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you to Funida Wamukama. What will be in it for us? We have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this in this time and in the age to come, eternal life. We're not brothers and sisters that the text ends with a testimony of Peter and his friends, those who left everything. Contrast it with the rich young ruler who couldn't leave what he had. Very important message Dr. Luke is communicating. The text ends with those who left everything in contrast with one who, who couldn't leave his wealth and give to the poor. Notice that Jesus is not advocating for divorce and family neglect in leaving behind all things. No, he's speaking about the sacrifice and commitment the kingdom of God calls for. The sacrifice and commitment the kingdom of God calls for. And he's saying that that sacrifice and commitment will be rewarded. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a place for laying down our plans, our agendas, our relational bonds for the kingdom of God. 
There is a place for laying down our plans and agendas and relational bonds for the kingdom of God. There's a place for even evaluating our bonds and asking the question, is the lordship of Jesus or the family that determines my course of life? Is it the lordship of Jesus or my family that determines my course of life? Is it the lordship of Jesus or my treasured relations that determine the course of my life? Many years ago, when I first resigned from McKinley University, probably it was about the second year after I resigned from McKinley, and I was pursuing what I felt God was calling me, full-time ministry, I met a, a young engineer. He's called Stanley. I'll not mention his other name in case, Stanley, you're watching me on the YouTube. But we met in Wandegea. I can remember the spot where we met in one year, before the lights were ever erected there. And he said to me, same Bido, I'm very disappointed with you. Because I thought that you would be the kind of person who would rise to become the professors we studied with. I'm disappointed. I had you have gone for ministry. What is this? He actually caught me off guard. I didn't have answers for him. I didn't have answers for him. But in his mind, the idea of being called by God to forsake all things was not part of the life agenda. Was not part of the life agenda. And Jesus is speaking into this point here and promising reward for those who have left everything. And the application question is this, brothers and sisters. What have you left behind for the sake of the kingdom. What have you left behind for the sake of the kingdom? I want to thank my sister who prayed for our brothers and sisters who have left much behind. They have left their families. They have left their spouses. They have left their children. And many of them are here pursuing ministerial formation in obedience to what they sense God has called them to do. But the question I ask is what? have you left behind? On the contrary, for many of us, it is actually those things which keep dragging us back. Dragging us back. Instead of moving forward, you're moving backwards. Dragged behind by the things of the world. What have you left behind for the sake of the kingdom? And also because of our fallenness, sometimes we come into the ministry and then we take the ministry as a platform for personal ambition. We take the ministry as a platform for personal ambition. In the eyes of human beings, it would seem as if we have not, I mean, we have left everything behind. But actually, we are using the ministry visibility and platform for our own agendas in the future. I want to become a politician, but let me be, begin by becoming a reverend. I want to begin an NGO, but let me begin by becoming a parish priest. We don't seem to have left things behind, but we use the ministry platform for our own agendas. Please notice as I close that in the words of Jesus, the only leaving behind which is rewarded is the leaving behind for the sake of the kingdom. Not all kinds of leaving behind, but the leaving behind for the sake of the kingdom. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Let me invite you to close your eyes. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and minister to us. Come, Holy Spirit, and open our eyes. Come, Holy Spirit, and show us the kingdom. The kingdom in our midst. Come, Holy Spirit, 
and open our ears to the voice of Jesus. In the message of this passage, you invite us this afternoon to be like children. You invite us this afternoon to forsake all things, to detach from what we have, share with our neighbors, and store treasure in heaven. Blessed Lord, now I pray for each of us that bring us to that place where we can say with the apostles, Master, we have left everything for the sake of the kingdom. I pray for those who have responded to the call to ministerial formation, that Lord our God will continue to strengthen them. Sometimes these two, three years are very challenging but strengthen them. I also pray for many who are following online and many under the sound of my voice who have been resisting the call of God. Resisting the call of God. Use your word, blessed Holy Spirit, to bring us into service of your kingdom. Thank you for hearing our prayer. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Okay. Let us stand and receive the blessing. And now may the Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace and the blessing and health of God Almighty God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and forevermore. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace. Amen. Uh, we shall give to that body. Uh, there is um, a basket over there.